So I'd like to focus today, does this work, on, uh, in particular, the um, vast diversity of envelope glycoproteins that HIV presents to the immune system. And hopefully convince you that that's kind of a, an important but underexplored area uh, that we need to understand better. So you probably have seen some of these numbers before, but it's been estimated that because of the error prone reverse transcriptase and recombination and HIV's rapid replication rate, the number of genomes in existence for HIV is astronomical, literally astronomical. It's estimated to be about 10 to the 16th power uh, just because of the mutations that are introduced every round of replication. That dwarfs the number of stars in the, the Milky Way galaxy and is kind of getting up towards the number of stars in the universe even. Um, so there's a tremendous uh, genetic diversity that we've understood uh, for a long time to be in existence. The part of the HIV pro uh, virus that evolves most rapidly um, is the envelope surface glycoprotein on the outside. Um, and so this is really a crucible for, for genetic uh, evolution in the virus. Um, and what I would like to talk about today is to try to understand how that genetic variation is actually manifested in the structure and then what is the impact on, um, on the phenotype of the virus and how it's perceived by the immune system. <clears throat> right. So, sorry, there's a little screen up here. I'm trying to, is there a way to minimize this up here? No, there's not. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the HIV envelope surface glycoprotein is the sole virally encoded uh, protein on the surface of the virus. Uh, I mentioned it's the most rapidly evolving part, in large part because of this competition with the, uh, the host immune system and selection that drives uh, envelope to continue to mutate. It's not just an antigen, but it actually performs a vital function for the virus in mediating receptor and co-receptor binding, as well as uh, triggering the fusion of the virus membrane with host membrane so that the genetic cargo in here can be delivered to start a new round of infection. So it plays really critical roles uh, for the virus and it's a sole antigenic target for, uh, for, for antibodies in the immune system. Uh, you probably, if you've been following the literature, have seen over the past several years that our structural understanding of envelope has advanced tremendously. So now there's high resolution structures for the, the ectodomain part of the envelope at least bound to numerous uh, neutralizing antibodies. Um, so we have very detailed understanding of how antibodies recognize static structures of envelope. Um, and this in large part has come uh, through crystallography, but even more so from cryoelectron microscopy. So we and other groups are now using cryo-EM to get high resolution structures of the envelope fusion glycoprotein complexed with antibodies. And we do learn a lot about that peritope-epitope interface. Um, and as beautiful as these types of structures are, I want to convince you today that that's really not all there is to understanding envelope as an antigen. <clears throat> so from these types of approaches, you can get detailed information uh, for the structure. So envelope is a classical type 1 fusion protein. It's composed of a receptor binding surface uh, subunit, GP120. And this has got both the receptor CD4 and co-receptor binding sites on it. And then it's got a second subunit here, GP41, which really is the membrane fusion machinery. The virus membrane would be down here, and there would normally be a very large cytoplasmic tail as well um, that we still are struggling to understand. In addition, this is truly a glycoprotein. About 50% of the mass of the ectodomain is actually composed of glycans or carbohydrates. And so these are just fragments of the glycan chains that are decorating the surface, but they really serve to limit the access of antibodies as well as receptors even to the key uh, protein surfaces that they need to recognize. So this is really like a big hairball uh, decorated by these glycans. Despite those challenges that envelope presents, there's actually been um, sort of this renaissance in understanding how neutralizing antibodies can recognize this antigen. So there's been observed to be numerous different sites of vulnerability on the envelope protein. Uh, these include targeting the CD4 binding site, such as by these antibodies here, this apex at the top of the trimer, which helps to maintain it in a closed prefusion conformation, um, the base of the V3 loop, which is also involved in co-receptor binding, and then some antibodies target the so-called membrane uh, proximal external region, or EMPER, uh, which is nestled down close to the viral membrane. <clears throat> 
Um, so there are numerous sites of vulnerability and through techniques like cryo-EM and crystallography, we're starting to understand um, how those antibodies recognize the glycoprotein trimer. Um, you can imagine for a virus that evolves as rapidly as HIV, if it's faced with this selective pressure from the immune system, it's going to find ways to try to evolve to escape that immune pressure. And it's done that in numerous ways. I mean, this is one of the things I, I love the most about this virus, as scary as it is, is it's, it's come up with every trick in the book to make it harder for antibodies to detect and, and neutralize this virus. So I already mentioned the dense glycan decoration that um, is, glycans tend to be very flexible in solution, so it makes it hard for an antibody to actually bind to the protein substrate. In contrast to a virus like flu that has hundreds of copies of this antigen on the surface, HIV has on average about anywhere from five to 15 copies of the trimer. So they're very sparsely uh, decorated on the surface. The impact of that is that it makes it really hard for a bivalent antibody to actually cross-link two of these antigenic targets together. Uh, so you lose a lot of avidity in the interaction and you, you make it much harder to cross-link these key uh, fusion proteins together. Um, so it's much easier for the virus then to continue to carry out its membrane fusion property uh, functions. In addition, and this will be the main focus of today, it turns out that this is not really a static target. Envelope, in contrast to some proteins like hemagglutinin from flu, is very flexible and dynamic in solution. And that, you can imagine, confers an entropic cost for docking with an antibody. It's just flexible, so it's hard to lock down a fixed target for the epitope. So this is a bit more detailed picture of the envelope uh, protein. And the whole reason that it does have these dynamic properties in part is because its main function to carry out membrane fusion requires that it undergo conformational changes from the pre-fusion state to intermediate states to pulling two membranes together. And that's, um, you know, this is a, a cartoon representation of the pre-fusion conformation of envelope. But in response to CD4 binding, it undergoes dramatic structural changes uh, and that actually makes possible uh, um, co-receptor binding, which binds to a, a, um, a binding site that had not actually existed before CD4 binds. And this uh, further induces additional conformational changes. It's actually believed that co-receptor interaction is the true um, trigger for membrane fusion that will allow the GP41 subunit to then grab hold of the target membrane and it refolds back to pinch these two membranes together. So it's an incredibly uh, dynamic uh, fusion machine, like other uh, fusion machinery in other viruses. The other way that HIV makes it very hard for the immune system to um, tackle this, this viral target is that issue of uh, viral diversity. So this is um, a kind of classic uh, comparison of, of, um, of diversity in HIV in a single chronically infected individual compared to the diversity of the virus, uh, of influenza virus in the human uh, population worldwide in a given year. So because of all the mutations and rapid evolution that takes place once the virus enters into a new individual, it actually, within a few years, achieves tremendous diversity. There can be up to 10% uh, variation among the virals, viruses within a quasi-species infecting a single person. Um, so it's really tremendous, and then if you, Zoom back and look at the diversity expressed in a country, uh, you can see that this is just orders of magnitude more challenging of a target than uh, influenza virus, which already we struggle to make a universal flu vaccine um, that can cover diverse strains of influenza virus. We ha have to come up with a new one every year. Um, if you zoom out even further, the diversity of viruses and subtypes worldwide is, is even more astronomical and it, there's quite a lot of different differences depending on the specific location and in, um, in, uh, part of the world that you're looking at. But there's numerous subtypes that can, um, between subtypes can vary up to 30% in sequence, um, sequence from one subtype to another. So it's maybe surprising that some rare individuals actually are able to develop um, immune activity that's able to neutralize a vast a number of the circulating types of isolates that have been um, characterized. Uh, this is often referred to as neutralization breadth, and that can cover in some cases up to 95 or even 98 percent of viruses that one uses um, to characterize sort of the diversity of HIV worldwide. So that's pretty, pretty incredible is that some people can mount immune responses that can recognize this kind of diversity of HIV.
Um, so what do we actually mean when we talk about neutralization breadth? That can take on different forms. Um, in one case, you can imagine that a patient um, develops antibodies that can target each individual isolate or variant of the virus that's circulating in their body. <clears throat> and this would be a broad polyclonal response. So that functionally could give rise to a broad neutralization activity. The one that gets vaccine people very excited, I think, is that um, certain individuals have developed these broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that just this one monoclonal antibody can actually recognize a huge diversity of uh, viral isolates. Um, <clears throat> so they do this by recognizing conserved features that don't vary or can't vary from one strain of HIV to the next. So features like the CD4 receptor binding site can't really vary, otherwise it would knock out the virus's ability to enter into cells. Um, another thing that I think you know, we don't really think about enough is um, neutralization, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies don't just recognize the conserved features, but they're able to figure out how to tolerate all the variation that's kind of in the context around those conserved epitopes. Um, so I think there's not really enough that's been done to, to understand how, how do these broadly neutralizing antibodies tolerate variation while they're binding to the conserved uh, set of residues. So we'd like to understand how do broadly neutralizing antibodies recognize a highly variable target? <clears throat> uh, what is the nature of structural variation between different strains of uh, HIV? <clears throat> and I think we need to understand variation much better in order to um, actually uh, understand how the immune system really copes with, with a highly variable target like HIV. So in the literature over the past several years, people have started to approach this question through kind of the classical methods like X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM. So we have here high resolution structures of the envelope ectodomain from different subtypes of the virus, A, B, uh, and G here. And you can probably already tell that architecturally these are very similar to each other. They're almost identical except in, in small local differences. <clears throat> One, uh, you know, so, so you might think, well, that just suggests that the overall architecture is completely conserved and envelope from one strain looks identical to the next. But there's a lot of caveats that go into these types of structures, um, and they're listed here. Most of these structures, uh, with the exception of Marie's uh, beautiful unligated structure for envelope, are determined with stabilizing fabs bound that tend to lock in specific conformational states. <clears throat> so that's uh, true of the vast majority of these high resolution structures. In addition, crystallography and cryo-EM both are based on selecting just small populations of the total particles, uh, total envelope copies you would have in a given uh, sample. Uh, in some cases for cryo-EM, the final high resolution structure you get might be based on five to 10% of the actual uh, examples of that trimer in a given solution. So what's the other 95% doing? Um, and so, you know, we do have a high resolution understanding of this trimer, but it really is just for one static state, uh, and that's the prefusion, what we sometimes call the closed conformation, before this thing is uh, seen the C4 receptor or any receptors. In reality, uh, envelope turns out to be much more heterogeneous, messier, and in solution it's much more dynamic. So we hypothesize you'll start to see much more evident isolate-specific differences if you actually start to look at these proteins and glycoproteins under native conditions where they're allowed to kind of live and breathe as they normally would. <clears throat> and our reason for thinking this is basically all proteins are actually highly dynamic entities. Uh, and that can take the form of dynamic fluctuations. So if this is you know, a high-resolution structure, structural model that you might see in a textbook, in reality, the protein is probably doing something a lot more like this. All the different parts of it, even stable structures like helices are actually breathing and fluctuating in solution. They also undergo sort of more programmed conformational changes, sometimes in response to ligand binding like a receptor. And then if we start looking at how two proteins like an antibody and an antigen interact, this might be the pretty view that you see you know, in a science paper. But if you looked in solution, this is actually more realistic in terms of how two proteins are actually recognizing each other. It's like two plates of spaghetti being mashed together and somehow the key residues need to find each other in this uh, dynamic heterogeneous mess. So how do we get at these questions and study these, uh, these issues experimentally? Uh, one technique that we use is a, a structural mass spec approach. And this is gonna sound kind of fancy, but it basically involves incubating your protein 
instead of in a, an H2O based buffer, you incubate it in a heavy water D2O deuterium uh, oxide buffer. And that gives the backbone groups, the backbone amide groups, a chance to pick up deuterium from the solution. Otherwise, it's completely native like in conditions. It's just a buffer made out of heavy water instead of uh, regular water. So you allow that incubation to proceed for a certain amount of time and carry out a time course. And then you quench the exchange reaction by acidifying this and putting it on ice. You chop up this partially deuterated protein uh, using a, a protease that's active under these quench conditions. And then for each of these partially deuterated peptides, you can actually analyze them uh, through reverse phase HPLC and uh, in the mass spec. So what we're showing here is a mass spectrum for one peptide um, in this protein. And this is the time course of incubation under these native deuterium uh, heavy water conditions. So you can actually see this mass spectra shift gradually as that peptide picks up more and more deuterium from its incubation. So from this type of uh, mass spectra, we can actually plot the kinetics of deuterium uptake for that specific peptide. And it actually tells us a lot about how well ordered the structure is in that, uh, for that specific peptide under those native conditions. So this, if you see this kind of kinetic plot, this would be a relatively dynamic peptide that's um, uh, transiently sampling a more exposed state, so it gradually takes up deuterium. If you have something like this that's pegged at 100% fully deuterated, even at the earliest time points, it was probably so disordered that it picks up deuterium as rapidly as you expose it to deuterium. If you have something incredibly well ordered, like in the core of a protein, uh, that will take up very little deuterium. Um, so that's basically you know, the, the sort of raw data that we get in order to analyze local structural fluctuations and dynamics for each of the peptides that we might be interested in in a protein under native conditions. So a nicer way to kind of represent this is in terms of these heat maps. So for example, we color things warm colors if they take up deuterium really rapidly. So this is a part of the protein that's very exposed. Uh, the amide groups are fully accessible to solvents, so it picks up deuterium very rapidly. Dynamic surface loops also will take up deuterium very rapidly. But amide groups in secondary structure are going to be already hydrogen bonded, so it's actually hard for them to pick up deuterium from solution. And then we can map all the data we have for all the peptides uh, back onto available structures, such as we've done here for hemagglutinin from flu. You can see it agrees really well with what's known from the structure. So these really stable helices take up very little deuterium. Dynamic surface loops pick up deuterium really readily and are warm colors here. So in order to get at this question of HIV envelope variation, we started by looking at sort of the, the simplest, best defined uh, part of the envelope protein. And that's the GP120 receptor binding subunit. So this is just GP120 monomers uh, in isolation, not in the context of a trimer. But again, this has both the CD4 and the co-receptor binding sites and many of the important epitopes of interest uh, for neutralizing antibodies. Again, and sorry if I'm <laughs> overemphasizing this, if we look at the crystal structures for ver really varied uh, viral isolates, they look almost identical in terms of the organization of the GP120 core. So to orient you, this is where CD4 would bind and co-receptor would come and bind somewhere along this surface up here. Um, and this conservation of the core structure at high resolution in crystals, you know, was basically universal across, again, diverse subtypes of HIV. So we thought this would be an interesting example to, to start examining uh, if we look at how this, this protein behaves under native conditions. So we chose a panel of four quite uh, phenotypically varied uh, GP120s, some from different uh, origins here, diff from different tissues. Uh, two are subtype B, two are subtype C, different co-receptor uses, and uh, even different neutralization sensitivities. And if we plot the heat maps of deuterium exchange onto these GP120, uh, onto the same GP120 structure, just so we can get a sort of spatial reference for how local regions change uh, in dynamics, we can see if we go from this lab-adapted HXB2 isolate to something like this, which is a clade C or subtype C uh, primary isolate, there's actually pretty dramatic differences in how well organized this GP120 subunit is. And it's actually easier if I just flip through them so you can see how these regions uh, change in terms of how well ordered they are. So again, this is where CD4 would bind, and it's also the target for a lot of uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies of interest. So you can imagine if you go from something like this, which is actually quite floppy 
in terms of uh, how well ordered GP120 monomers are compared to something like this, which is much more well ordered, that would have a pretty substantial antigenic impact um, just because it's harder for an antibody to recognize a floppier or dynamic target. So in fact, that's exactly what we saw. We compared a panel of GP120 constructs that have a sort of span a spectrum of uh, structural dynamics. And basically for every antibody recognizing a conformational epitope that we could uh, test, we saw an inverse correlation of how well that antibody can bind with how dynamic that protein is. So the more dynamic this, this viral isolate has for GP120, the more poorly the antibody is able to recognize conformational epitopes. So even just from looking at this one subunit, we can already say that we see distinct isolate specific differences, and that does have a direct impact on the ability of anti antibodies to recognize this target. So now we kind of want to look at more complex examples of the envelope uh, trimer. And these are of tremendous interest now for, for vaccine uh, as vaccine immunogens, people trying to create the most authentic like um, trimeric form of the ectodomain and present that as an immunogen to elicit antibodies, hopefully that have sort of the broadly neutralizing activity. <clears throat> so the question we asked here is how varied in structural organization are envelope trimers? Again, if you look at the structures uh, by high resolution methods, they look very similar to each other. But the first, uh, and even more so now, there's um, dozens of these structures available. And again, the architecture is incredibly well conserved for different antibodies bound, um, different viral isolates. But the first sense that um, envelope trimers might actually be different if you look at them under native conditions uh, from one isolate to another came from a, a technique called small uh, single molecule fluorescence resonance energy transfer or FRET, single molecule FRET. So in these experiments, um, James Monroe and Walter Mathis were able to put two fluorescent dyes at different parts of the uh, envelope glycoprotein trimer. They could actually see just at rest as envelope exists on the surface of a virus, there's not just a single conformational state populated as reported by FRET but there's actually up to three different conformational states, three different positions of these, these two fluorescent, uh, fluorescent fl two fluorophore pairs. Um, and so already they could tell that some of these viral isolates have envelope that's kind of fluctuating between different conformational states. The other cool thing that they found is that depending on which strain you look at, the relative abundance of those different populations is actually quite different. So this um, very neutralization sensitive NO43 lab adapted uh, isolate actually is very dynamic. It's sampling multiple different conformational states. By contrast, JRFL, a primary isolate that's actually relatively hard to uh, neutralize, appears to primarily populate the prefusion closed form of the trimer, though it does transiently sample some of these other conformational states. So this was pretty intriguing, um, but it doesn't actually tell you much structurally uh, about you know what what are the different ep how are how are these structural transitions affecting different epitopes? So that's where the technique that we apply can come in. So we wanted to compare two different trimers um, from two different uh, primary isolates. So these were both uh, identified in Julie Overbaugh's lab here at the Hutch. BG505 is the first one, and BF520 is the second. Both of these are clade A or subtype A uh, transmitted founder viruses um, that were isolated from mother to child transmission events. Uh, BG505 is kind of now the sort of the reference gold standard for envelope trimers. This is a trimer that really likes to stay in the closed prefusion state. It doesn't sample other conformations nearly as readily as, as some other cases. BF520, we didn't know nearly as much about this one uh, to start with, uh, so we thought it would be a really interesting comparison because it has a lot of the same kind of history as BG505 in terms of being transmitted founder and from mother to child transmission. So if you look at low resolution by negative stain electron microscopy, you can see all these trimers here. They're all well-formed trimers in both cases. And at this resolution, they actually look essentially identical to each other. So both of these uh, recombinant trimers look equally well-ordered and nicely formed trimers. Uh, if we start looking at these by the structural mass spec approach, however, uh, we start to see some interesting differences. 
So we always try to, to have a, an internal standard in this, uh, looking at this peptide here, the GP120, GP41 interface just tells us we are looking at well-formed trimers and we don't have monomer or aggregate contaminants. So in this case, they agree very well, structurally identical at that site. But if you start looking, for example, at the CD4 binding site, and in orange here are these kinetic uptake plots, uh, deuterium uptake plots for the BF520 isolate, and in blue were the BG505 uh, isolates for the identical peptide um, in BG505. So these are peptides that are involved in interacting with the CD4 primary receptor, and you can see already significant differences in how well-ordered some of these key peptides at this really interesting epitope are between these two isolates. In general, BF520 tends to be much more dynamic. It picks up deuterium much more readily than the BG505 uh, envelope trimer. If we look at other epitopes of interest for broadly neutralizing antibodies, such as this apex here, V1, V2 apex, again, BF520 exhibits much more uh, substantial local dynamics compared to BG505. And that extends even into core regions of the GP120 subunit. In all these cases, BF520 is more, more dynamic and flexible than BG505. We can also see some pretty interesting things if we look a little more closely into the data. <clears throat> so this is a particular peptide that's almost like a linchpin that holds this V1, V2 apex together and prevents it from opening up and sampling the CD4 bound conformation. So in the closed prefusion state, this forms <clears throat> nice stable interactions. Uh, and we can see for BF520, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, this again is somewhat more dynamic and flexible than the BG505 trimer. If we look at the <coughs> specific mass spectra for BG505, just a single conformational state can explain all these mass spectra across the deuterium um, incubation reaction. We see, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. <coughs> if we look at B BF520, we find that a single state doesn't actually explain the data that we measure. You actually need to, to take into account at least two different conformational states. One is the closed, well-ordered form of the trimer, but then the second state, illustrated here in red, is actually a much more exposed, more dynamic form of the trimer. And the, the interesting thing you can also see is that there's kind of an exchange between these two different uh, populations. You start from being in essentially all the closed uh, prefusion trimer and getting more and more um, sampling of a more open state. So this already suggests that not only is BF520 trimer more floppy and flexible, but it's actually undergoing a switching between two different conformational states. And this holds for other uh, key epitopes as well. So this peptide here is in the base of the V3 loop and is involved in co-receptor interactions as well as the target for numerous broadly neutralizing antibodies. This shows a very similar profile in terms of there being multiple conformational states that are being sampled by this uh, given peptide. So if we go throughout this BF520 trimer and map out all the different peptide sites that do appear to undergo conformational sampling, those are highlighted here in the structure in magenta. And orange are just the, the sites that are also more flexible and dynamic in BF520 compared to BG505. So the interesting pattern that we see is all these sites actually are sites that typically would respond to CD4 binding. Um, and that's illustrated in this heat map on the right. So it seems like all the sites that are actually reporting on conformational switching, the nature of that switching is actually between the closed prefusion state and a conformation that's similar to the receptor bound, uh, interact, uh, receptor bound conformation. But this again is in the absence of any CD4. So just BF520 trimers alone under native conditions are actually transiently sampling that receptor bound state. So this is sort of the model that we compose based on that type of data, <clears throat> is that there can be this uh, dynamic sampling between a closed prefusion state and this more dynamic open conformation. So I think from this kind of really basic data, we're starting to understand kind of how the different parts of this complex machine are actually tied together. But there's also an antigenic impact of this dynamic sampling. Um, this is sort of a busy slide here, but if you look at CD4 bounding, uh, sorry, CD4 binding site targeting neutralizing antibodies, they all recognize the BF520 trimer better because it appears to be sampling that receptor bound conformation even before CD4 is bound. So it kind of preforms this, the conformational 
state for the CD4 binding site that's preferentially recognized by a lot of these ligands and CD4 binding site targeting antibodies. But if you look at this, PG, uh, this V1, V2 apex at the top of the trimer, that's the motif that typically holds this trimer together in the closed prefusion form. <clears throat> but if the trimer is dynamically sampling in open state, that interface is actually being disrupted. And that's the target for PGT145. And you can see that there's an impact, a reduced affinity that this antibody has for the more dynamic VF520 trimer. Um, the V3 loop, which is normally sequestered and tucked under V1, V2, becomes more accessible in the more dynamic trimer as well. So uh, it's just to illustrate that there is a direct antigenic impact for um, structural dynamics in the native trimers. Okay, so there are, there are isolate specific differences and they're pretty substantial. Um, and this does have a direct impact in the context of the trimer as well as in the GP120 subunit we talked about first. So if we really wanna get at this question of you know, understanding variation in envelope, do we have to now, Eddie, look at 10 to the 16th variants of, of these proteins? Uh, that would be a very long PhD. Um, people have started trying to kind of systematize phenotypic variation in, in, in different HIV variants. And one way they've done this is by coming up with this neutralization tier scheme. Uh, this is primarily from Mike Seaman and David Montefiore. And they examine hundreds of different HIV variants and characterize their neutralization sensitivity to pooled HIV positive sera. And so they came up with this, uh, this um, type of a scheme where on the Y axis here is the neutralization sensitivity in, in form of ID50 to that pooled serum. And then they rank ordered the, the different viral isolates here. So they categorized this spectrum of viruses into different tiers going from very easy to neutralize viruses that they called tier 1A uh, viruses over here, I'm sorry, uh, over here, and uh, 1B as well. Things like NL43, that lab-adapted isolate, uh, tend to be things that are very easy to neutralize with pooled sera, so they would be a tier 1A type of virus. The more characteristic viruses that one typically would encounter um, as primary isolates tend to be tier 2, or in some cases tier 3, very hard to neutralize viruses. So people would love in the vaccine field to figure out how to elicit neutralizing antibodies that recognize a broad swath of tier two relatively neutralization resistant viruses. Um, there's sort of a, a schematic dogma that accompanies this tier scheme. Um, and this is uh, um, illustrated here. So the belief is that tier 1A easy to neutralize viruses are primarily sampling this open conformation where the V1, V2 loops are not well packed against each other and the V3 loop is very easily accessible because there tends to be a lot of uh, antibodies against V3 and pooled sera from HIV's positive patients. By contrast, if you look at a neutralization resistant virus, a tier two virus, the belief is that this would occupy or populate the closed prefusion state uh, almost all the time and not expose uh, some of these um, typical epitopes for, for antibodies that would be found in typical sera. So this is kind of the, the scheme that's been put out there, but it's actually not really based on too much data. There's not too much uh, comparison that's been done structurally of um, different envelopes to correlate that with neutralization sensitivity or even most phenotypes in general. So rather than looking at 10 to the 16th uh, variants, amazingly, it, uh, from comparing hundreds of different HIV isolates, David Montefiore and his collaborators were able to demonstrate that you could look at a, a panel of just 10, uh, sorry, 12, uh, 12 to 15 HIV isolates. And that captures largely the sort of diversity of antigenic variation uh, among uh, sort of the global population of, of circulating HIV. So instead of having to look at 10 to 16th, we can look at the more tractable problem, at least to start, uh, of, 10, uh, of 12 viral variants. So those 12 are illustrated here on that same tier scheme is just flipped uh, along the x-axis here. So these are all primarily tier two isolates. There's a couple of very hard to uh, neutralize uh, viruses also thrown in there. By contrast, something like SF162 is very easy to neutralize and is a tier 1A virus here. But the panel of interest are really these guys that occupy that relatively hard to neutralize 
um, swath of the scheme. So we've just started on this, and this is very preliminary, but um, the first one we looked at is CE1176. This is a subtype C virus. Again, categorized as tier two, hard to neutralize. The really interesting thing that we saw is um, for a lot of the peptides that we, we examine in this CE1176 trimer, it actually looks in many ways more reminiscent of the dynamic BF520 trimer. So for example, this uh, peptide here at the base of V3, again, is sampling multiple conformational states and going transiently back and forth between these populations. <clears throat> um, some of Eddie's data here, this is a peptide in GP120 that responds to CD4 binding. Um, so it undergoes a really dramatic structural reorganization when CD4 is bound or versus the pre-fusion state. This one as well, it's a bit hard to see with the colors here, but this, you also need more than one population, conformational population to really describe the structural dynamic data that we measure. So this appears to be, and this is, the analysis is still ongoing, but it appears to be a very dynamic trimer, despite it being very neutralization resistant um, and one of these tier two viruses. Um, Alex Milliant in the lab used cryo-electron tomography to look at a population of these trimers under native conditions. And in contrast to something like BG505, where you really only see the closed prefusion state, he's actually by EM, so a completely orthogonal method to the, the mass spec approach, he's also seeing evidence for multiple different conformational states for this trimer. So the uh, dogma, at least, uh, based on an N of one so far, is that this scheme that we've associated closed uh, trimers that maintain the closed uh, sort of static prefusion conformation, that they would necessarily be um, neutralization resistant um, or vice versa, that newt resistant viruses always have to occupy this closed prefusion state doesn't really seem to be holding up so far. Um, but we do need to examine the other um, viral isolates in that panel of 12. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we, as we got more and more understanding of the virus, initially we kind of thought maybe this would be not too challenging of a viral target, and especially as we got structures, we kind of think, oh, we, we understand this protein antigen now, and, you know, we know how this antibody is recognizing it. So it sort of seems like a tractable problem, but I think the more information we've gotten now, as we start to kind of understand the scope of variation in this virus. Um, it's kind of like now we're here, and this is the problem that we're faced with is understanding, you know, this vast diversity and how it's manifested in the structure. Let alone <clears throat> if, you, if you then like zoom out to that countrywide view of HIV diversity, it's something more like this, and we're here. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think there is a path. <laughs> Uh, to actually, you know, broach some of these problems. And it's a little bit reductionist to think so, but I think some of these issues of understanding how these envelope proteins are sampling different states, it's pretty fundamental. I mean, it's just, it's physics in terms of the impact on antibody binding. So I think that's really a key determinant of some of the phenotypes in terms of neutralization sensitivity that we're starting to understand. Okay. So is genetic variation in HIV-1 envelope insurmountable or surmountable? Uh, from the existence of these broadly neutralizing antibodies, we know it can be done. The immune system has on multiple occasions come up with uh, solutions at least to neutralizing the vast majority of viruses. They don't actually ever clear the virus from a patient, but if you had those kind of antibodies before infection, it's very likely that they would prevent infection pretty efficaciously. Um, so the hope is that through vaccines and immunization, we can elicit this type of a broadly neutralizing antibody response. But I think to get there, um, you know, there's, there's some promising signs, but I think we still need to understand envelope better as a target for these broadly neutralizing antibodies, especially to understand how these antibodies recognize variation and, and cope with it. So I think uh, we need a better understanding of structure, but also the dynamic determinants of antibody as well as B-cell receptor engagement that would kick off um, sort of the evolution of the immune system against this target. And, you know, it still remains to be seen, but I, uh, we hope that we can actually take that vast diversity and take a, a somewhat reductionist view and understand more of the physical determinants of antigenicity by doing these types of studies and then get a better understanding of 
you know, how do you pick the right immunogen? What strain do you want to start with in order to have a better chance of eliciting antibodies of interest? Um, so I think the more we understand about variation structure and dynamics, the better of a hope we have of actually doing rational uh, vaccine approaches. So this work was carried out by uh, the lab here. I've tried to indicate the different people involved in each of the slides. Um, the HD exchange work was really pioneered by Mike Gutman in the lab, who's now got his own group at UW, which is great. Shulak Hu actually um, got me into HIV uh, from the safe world of influenza. And that was largely in part actually thanks to uh, Center for AIDS Research grant in this CNIHR program, uh, Creative Novel Ideas in HIV Research. It's kind of a grand name for the grant program. But this is intended to bring people who are outside of the HIV field in to bring new techniques and maybe new perspectives. And I think it's a, a fantastic program. I hope it continues. Uh, so Shulak was a mentor on that program who helped kind of introduce me to the field of HIV and, and kind of lead the way with some wisdom. We've also had a really nice collaboration uh, with Julie Overbaugh's group, including with Laura and Cassie. Um, and we've worked uh, closely uh, with the people who developed these SOSIP forms of the trimer that uh, finally, after decades, gave us a construct that actually does mimic the native-like form of the trimer pretty authentically, though not perfectly. Okay, thank you. Wonderful talk, thank you. Um, one quick question and another. Uh, where is that photo taken? Oh, <laughs> this one? Yeah. It's Switzerland. Switzerland's amazing. It's made out of magic. <laughs> um, it's in the um, the Berner Bernese Overland region near. Um, it's in the Alps. <laughs> it's called. Uh, uh, I'm going to horribly butcher the name. Oceanen Sea Lake, Oceanen, something like that. Um, yeah, that's the color of the lake. It's turquoise and it's spectacular. That's a hard trail. This is the easy part, but then it goes up pretty far. Uh, but it's beautiful. It's a really nice place to go. It's near the town of Kandersteg. <laughs> well, if, if you think about the, the basis of the, whether a protein is going to be flexible or very dynamic versus more stable. I, I think about amino acid substitutions that are going to disrupt the hydrogen bonding and, and other interactions in the supply chain. And if that's the basis for uh, a protein being uh, more dynamic or less dynamic, then you would think maybe that the, uh, the dynamical regions of the protein would be more isolated. Mm. But what I'm seeing, and maybe maybe this is a wrong impression, but some proteins seem to be dynamic throughout the protein, and others, uh, you know, less dynamic throughout the protein, which suggests to me that maybe there's something sort of beneath the uh, surface structure that is uh, in some manner determining the dynamism mm. of the uh, outer surface. Do you have any thoughts on? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, if I understand it right, I mean, I think there's sort of two levels of dynamics. One is just the very local uh, flexibility of a given protein region. And that does vary a lot from one strain to the other. But then there's sort of this additional level of conformational switching between different states. Um, and that's sort of on top of or maybe underneath the other local dynamics. So we haven't really looked at enough envelopes to know if those two things are always correlated. Um, I think they may not necessarily be fully correlated because, for example, CE 1176, which samples these multiple states, it actually has a variable V1, V2 variable loop that is still able to actually bind to some of those apex targeting antibodies, even though it's undergoing this conformational switching. So that might be a case where there's still some local stability for the epitope, but it undergoes conformational sampling. Um, so, but you're right. I think there's there's multiple layers of, of dynamics that that's exhibited in these machines, um, and we need to sample more examples to really know if those are correlated fully. 
it is interesting. I mean, individual single mutations. So this is something that Julie's lab found. You can take something like BG505, which is a really well-formed trimer. And if you introduce a single mutation, it can actually make it still make good trimers, but it becomes much more dynamic. And in their case, it actually conferred the ability to engage with macaque CD4. Um, so quite a different phenotypic change, but it seems to be because it helps form that CD4 binding site that then can be recognized by macaque CD4. Whereas in that closed prefusion state, macaque CD4 can't really engage with the trimer very well. That single amino acid chain, was that a surface? Uh, or was it something underneath the it's surface? kind of buried. Um, do you remember, Laura? It's A204E is one. There's actually a handful of different um, mutations that have a similar phenotype, but they're not typically fully solvent accessible surface residues. They would, you know, probably somehow that mutation disrupts some key interaction that sort of opens up, uh, releases a switch or a lock, I guess. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it seems like it's still early days, but uh, if, if you're correct, and the uh, sensitivity to neutralization is not related to relative dynamics and confirmation of stability, do you have any alternative hypotheses you'd like to like address? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, we don't know. Um, it could be something like glycosylation patterns, um, you know, very specific things of if this trimer turns out to be more dynamic and exposes these epitopes, which typically would get recognized, maybe in that case it needs some glycans nearby to protect that epitope. Hopefully it doesn't come down to being very individual case specific, but that is possible. Um, I think the reason that sort of schema and dogma is attractive is it's nice and simple, but if there's anything about this virus is it, it you know, there's not really necessarily rules that it follows. Um, so it might turn out to be very individual case specific and in how um, a particular trimer becomes much more neutralization resistant. Yeah. But, it, but it suggests you need to kind of go some distance down that road in order to get to where you would have be able to select strains for rational vaccines. Right, so exactly. You've got to have some notion of mechanism. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think we're, we're first starting by just testing that hypothesis that, you know, whether dynamics are one of the key determinants, but if it turns out not to pan out, then we'll have to look at other alternative possibilities. Um, it could be, you know, variable, you know, variable loop lengths also is a, a important factor. Um, yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that um, any of the data would change if you look at versus the echo domain. Ah. It's, it does make a difference. So I totally glossed over this point, but all these trimers that I've been talking about are recombinant engineered trimers, and they do have mutations that have been introduced to make them stay in that trimeric form in, in recombinant systems. And it's pretty extreme. They have a disulfide between the GP120 and GP41 subunit. They have an isoleucine to a proline mutation in part of GP41 that normally would go from being a loop to a helix as it undergoes that structural change. So they're pretty significant um, alterations to this thing. So they're, they're referred to as native-like trimers. And that's based on the observation that antigenically, they pretty, uh, they're pretty good mimics for native trimers on cell surface or on, on the surface of viruses. So um, we have looked at full length, well, the closest we've gotten is looking at a, a native G, BG505 trimer that doesn't have those disulfide and isoleucine and proline mutations. And it's presented on the surface of VSV, vesicular somatitis virus, but it doesn't, it has the VSV G protein transmembrane anchor and the G tail instead of HIV envelopes giant cytoplasmic tail. So that's the closest we've gotten so far. That one is actually much more dynamic than BG505 SOSIP uh, recombinant trimers. I guess I had maybe another question. It seemed to be, at least with the BF505, there was some trade off with binding affinity dynamics, right? So the more dynamic trimer seemed to bind the CD4 binding site antibodies better, but more poorly than the Yeah, those 
tend those two epitopes usually kind of right, go in sort of the opposition. Of yeah. So it might make it a little bit hard to draw, like hard conclusions about how dynamic stability affects neutralization. Yeah. I mean, depending I, on the epitope, right? Right. It's very epitope specific. Um, I guess when people talk about sensitivity, it's usually with this pooled sera, which is mostly, I think, dominated by anti V3 sort of antibodies. Yeah. But yeah, you might not have one immunogen that gives you all the epitopes optimally. <laughs> so, so what I'm what I what I wonder is how it's then that then there are um, protein-protein uh, interaction, and in a in a in a in a dynamic situation, the the key interaction is in membrane all the time, or what happens? To you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if it's known. You like yeah, if these three residues need to come together despite everything going on around them, do they stay? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and another question <laughs> is that, um, so, they, so when antibodies are generated, they, you know, so do they recognize the um, more flexible uh, part of, is there any, any uh, like the epitopes recognize, um, the epitopes recognize uh, more flexible or more stable transformation? I mean, I guess it'll depend on the specific B cell receptor and antibody. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, so everything I've focused on is for conformational epitopes, where you can imagine different parts of the protein need to come together to form the epitope. So you can imagine if this thing becomes more dynamic, it's harder for an antibody to recognize that set of residues. The, it's the opposite case for a linear epitope. So if that is well ordered, then um, it may, may be harder for an antibody specific for that to recognize it because it might require specific, you know, confirmation for that linear epitope. Uh, so if it's in a well ordered structure that's contrary to that confirmation, it'd be hard to bind. Whereas if it's flexible, it'd at least be sampling the right state for that antibody to bind. So it's kind of the opposite for linear epitopes versus conformational, but I don't, I don't know if there's any general rules on which ones are easier to uh, elicit. Most of the HIV conformational epitopes are, I think, pretty hard to get antibodies against because they're so well protected by the glycans, just by the sterics of the, the trimer structure. So like CD4, the CD4 binding site is, I mean, this thing must have evolved to make it really hard for antibodies to, to get at that site because it's tucked away and it's got this mesh of or fence of glycans all around it. Um, so most of the conformational epitopes for HIV are pretty, pretty tucked away and hard to get at. And so some antibodies also need to evolve very long CDR loops to reach through the glycans to get to the epitope. Um, and those are pretty hard to, to raise, I, I guess. Um, I'll tell you why I'm asking this question, so otherwise we make these. Uh, I'm trying to think about uh, cellular, cellular immune recognition of these proteins. And I wonder, I don't remember from your slide um, uh, whether or not the proteins were fully uh, denatured prior to proteolytic cleavage of the deuterated uh, proteins or not, or, or was there uh, can you look at sort of the dynamics of uh, proteolysis as, oh. as uh, another factor in, in, uh, in characterizing it? That, yeah. I, I wonder, I mean, the presentation of peptides on HLA molecules mm. um, could be influenced by, is obviously influenced by the linear sequence of peptide, right. but also could be influenced by proteolysis. Yeah. And, uh, no, that's a great question. So in these experiments, the deuteration is done when the protein is still natively folded. But then before it's cleaved, do you denature it or do you... Yeah, it gets uh, acidified and that tends to acid denature the protein. 
um, and that makes it such that pepsin can actually come and cleave. Um, but and I don't unfortunately know the literature very much on this, but I think people have looked for where are the sites in envelope that tend to get cut uh, during processing. Um, but I don't off the top of my head know how that correlates with the structure at all. So yeah, after it's, uh, I guess, endocytosed and starts getting chewed up, I'm not sure what the structure is there and, and then what cleavage sites are accessible. But I, I'm pretty sure there's some literature on that, but I should know better. <laughs> Okay, well, nobody has any more questions. Thank you. Show me in thanking Kelly for a great talk. And I guess it's